You have a knife, you have a basket, hopefully, and if not, you can have a paper bag, which will get a little bit wet. It's no big deal. You can use a backpack, but you really want something that's porous so that the mushroom spores can fall out and disperse, as opposed to us basically clear-cutting like what happened here before we got here about 40, 50 years ago. So right now, I'm not going to give the wrap. We're going to go in about 15 feet. I mean, a bunch of trees, so I'm going to hang out next to this huge stump, the old growth that used to be here, and I'll give a little rap about the timber sale and uh, hopefully blow your minds a little bit without my apology. So, we're going to go in on this little trail here. One, two. does these monthly hikes to get people out into the woods, not just for the fun stuff like picking mushrooms, but to actually educate the public about the timber sales that are happening on Mount Hood. This happens to be the Jazz Timber Sale. It is huge. It is 2,000 acres of cutting in a 40 square mile area with 78 different actual units of logging. And Myself and a number of other folks here do what we call ground truthing. And we come out to every single project at the Mount Hood National Forest, the Forest Service proposes on Mount Hood. And we go into these areas and we see if the reality is the same as what the Forest Service is telling us on paper. And oftentimes it's not. And so that's why we do this ground truthing. It's extremely important. We stop timber sales by doing this on the ground work. We take photographs, we take measurements, 
we find a stream that they didn't have on their maps, we find a lake, we find endangered species, we find unbelievably mycologically diverse areas where I get to take people mushroom hunting and get you more involved in the actions that our government is doing, some good, some bad. So this timber sale is huge and is problematic because as you saw that little mud bath you had to drive through, uh, this entire watershed and along that Kaliwash River uh, where the freeway widened out and all the cliffs and everything, uh, you can see all those slides. And this entire watershed is extremely slide prone, it's very unstable soils. And <clears throat> as we, as ground truthers, have been going out to these 78 different units, we've been seeing evidence of past landslides from the original clear cutting. And uh, that old growth, where we just went through that, that mud trail, uh, that was old growth that slid. So it's not just the stuff that's been cut. Uh, it's not just the bad roads that the Forest Service has put in with bad cut sides. And so we have that problem with this timber sale. Uh, this forest, as you look at it, is coming back very nicely. There's lots of small hemlocks coming up. There's lots of underbrush. Everything is doing well. It is all mostly uh, Douglas fir, but uh, is coming back very nicely and we don't personally think that this place should be cut again. A million reasons why. One of those would be climate change. These forests, and they've been doing lots and lots and lots more studies on carbon sequestration. A live tree sequesters a heck of a lot more carbon than a dead tree, even though the timber industry and other people like to say that it's locked up in that 2x4. <laughs> Actually, it is locked up in that 2x4, but it's also not sequestering more carbon because it's dead. And these forests are unbelievable sinks for carbon. And they can only do that when they're alive. So we have issues with the stability of the soils out here, climate stuff, we have mushroom stuff as well. And this area doesn't really need to be thinned, um, and especially with the instability. And there are endangered salmon down in the Kalawash and the Clackamas River, etc that are endangered through past government practices of clear-cut logging, herbicide spraying, etc., on our national forest. So when we do these hikes, it is you who actually makes the Forest Service do the right thing. Because at the end of the day, we will ask all of you to write a little note to the Forest Service about this timber sale. And because you're here, you have personal, physical experience with it. And you're going to be picking mushrooms that are completely sustainable. You can come back here for the next 20, 50,000 years and pick these mushrooms. And you could pay for a permit if you were to do it commercially, etc. You could actually have an income if you wanted to out of this area. But we're doing something that uh, is basically a sustainable practice. The uh, mushroom is basically like an apple on a tree. And so, the reason we take all these people out here is to get these comment cards and to get the Forest Service to realize that we do actually have a lot of concerned citizens and educated citizens in Portland who care about Mount Hood, care about the ecosystems, care about the water, care about the salmon, etc., and are willing to come out and check out these timber sales, either through ground truthing, and we can always use more volunteers for that. So if anybody gets super excited today, you can talk to me or Candace or Alex, um, a number of other people. Um, if you want to get more involved with BARC in numerous ways. And it is you. Like we have stopped timber sales. And it's not just from our ground truthers or our you know, crack team at the office who are doing all this good work. It is people like you making these comments. You know, we're fighting Nestle, we're fighting other timber sales, etc. So if you don't like bottled water, you can get involved in that campaign as well. If you don't like some of this timber sale stuff that you're checking out, please get even more involved than just coming out on this Sunday hike. Um, and we do this all year, so you can just have a hike every month. One, two.
are standing in one of the most amazing ecosystems on this planet. And I say that because every ecosystem on this planet is amazing. And this forest that you see around you is interconnected to itself. This Douglas fir tree is actually connected to one 100 feet away and 300 feet up the hill and 250 feet down the hill through an underground network called mycorrhizae. Myco is fungus, rhizae is root. A couple different kinds of mycorrhizal associations is what they're called. And the fungus attaches itself to the root, either on the outside or actually on the inside of the root. And through that symbiotic relationship, the tree sends down photosynthates. And 50% of a tree's actual photosynthates goes to its roots. 90% of that 50% goes to the fungus. Only 10% goes into the actual tree's roots. And the fungus helps this tree survive. And in fact, none of these trees, none of these shrubs, none of what you see here would be alive without the fungus and vice versa. The fungus wouldn't be here without the tree as well. And fungi is basically the roots and fungus is what you would call it, and a mushroom is the actual fruit body. So like an apple on a tree, the mushroom is the apple, and the tree would be the fungus. So people say fungus or fungi. Fungi is the broad category. Myke, mycorrhizae are the actual connections of that fungal root attached to those trees. So all of these trees and all of these shrubs are actually interlinked, and they're linked to each other. So this fungus will link this tree and an Oregon grape, and a vine maple, and a birch, and an aspen. And what will happen, you know, they've been doing all this research, so in early spring there's no leaves on the vine maple. It's not photosynthesizing, nor is the birch or the alder or these other trees. So this Douglas fir, through that underground fungal network, is actually helping that vine maple by transporting carbon over to it in the early spring. In summer, when perhaps the Douglas fir is shaded because the vine maples and the alders and whatnot have leafed out, they reciprocate and transfer carbon to that Douglas fir or other shaded plants that need it. Not a single seedling of a tree in this forest would survive without having that mycorrhizal association within 24 hours of sprouting. None of them. So this mycorrhizal association, it feeds the tree nitrogen, it feeds it phosphorus, it feeds it potassium. And in the summer in the Northwest, we have a three month drop. And it feeds it water for those three months so that tree doesn't go into dormancy and can continue to photosynthesize and grow and do all the things that it does. So there is this relationship that, that we don't even know. We're beginning to understand what is below ground. These trees themselves, 50% of this tree is below ground. You're only seeing what's above. Its roots are another 50%. And then when you get that mycorrhizal association on it, that tree's roots are this big, and when you get that mycorrhizal association, it expands by 100 times. Because those little hyphae and those little mycorrhizae can get in between those small soil particles and spread throughout the soil and access that nitrogen and access that phosphorus. And so these fungi, they also protect the tree. They protect the tree when it's connected to its roots by preventing any soil pathogens or diseases from attacking those roots. They feed it the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. They feed it water. They create a microclimate around the roots that allows for let me show you some. It's a little hard to see, but the, what I'm talking about, this is the chanterelle, the golden chanterelle, uh, that we're going to be mostly picking today. There's also white ones out here as well. This mushroom is mycorrhizally attached to this tree. So when we're picking these mushrooms, we're actually, we're very connected to this entire ecosystem through this fungal network. 
And you can see these white threads. That's what I'm talking about. These white threads are actually binding this soil together. You can see how it'll hang. Binding this soil together. And this is the mycelium of the chanterelle that is, again, connected. We don't even know to how many different species of plants. So far, they have found that the Douglas fir has 2,000 different species of mycorrhizae fungi so far that we know are connected to it. This research is still, there's a lot of people doing it, but it's still in its infancy. Um, and 90% of all terrestrial plants have this mycorrhizal association. They require it. They will not survive without it. So when we pick up like this little piece of soil here, a handful of soil, there's 10 billion bacteria in it. Most of those are unknown to science. There's 10 million fungi in it, little small pieces that don't actually produce mushrooms. Most of those unknown to science. There's about 2 million species of fungi that we think on this planet, 70,000 of them have been named and described. So this science or this field of study, we know nothing. So even what I'm saying blows my mind, how all of this is interconnected. And you can drop phosphorus at the base of this tree and within hours, you can radiocarbonate, within hours go 300 feet away and find that same phosphorus has been transported to a tree that needed it. So, we've all been taught in school that nature tooth and or raw and tooth and claw, it's all fighting for its survival against the rest of nature. And there's probably some of that. But it's certainly not true for a large part of it. As humans, we have been required to live in communities and help each other for 99.999% of our existence. How do you think this planet got here? How do you think these ecosystems got here without helping each other out? So why would that vine maple allow its carbon resources, its photosynthates, go to help this Douglas fir? Because they're all helping each other and they're all working together. So just think about that as we're actually going through this forest, um, that everything in here is connected and everything is helping it, it, each other. And that's what we're gonna be doing as well when we write these comment cards and try and get the Forest Service to not do this timber sale project and to keep this forest standing for a billion other reasons that I could get into as well. But we'll kind of leave it at that. The people who are helping are gonna go in on the right and up about 500 feet and have a couple people at the top. And all of you are gonna go in and swing to the left and just keep going 1,000, 2,000 feet. We'll be in this forest for about an hour. So give yourself that time check and then we'll go back to the road. If we need more time, we will definitely go get more. Yep. And to pick mushrooms. <coughs> if you have a folding knife, you will fold it every single time after picking a mushroom. <laughs> The first time you almost stab yourself in the neck by falling over a log, you will never keep it open again. Um, if you have a basket, you can put your knife in your basket, etc. So there's a couple uh, mushroom picking uh, ideas. If you can get over the mushroom with your hands, go ahead and grab it from the top, grab the stem, twist and pull it out. And then after you twist and pull it out, you're going to cut the butt. So you're not going to eat that anyway. And it's biomass that should stay in the forest and regenerate um, and create more forest. And it, you can clean the, the bottom if you want as well. And then put it in a basket. Um, the next time you guys come out mushroom hunting, you'll all have baskets. <laughs> Paper bags are going to fall apart, but they'll work for a little while. Uh, these kind of baskets are great. Plastic is horrible. Um, you will, once you get home, you'll put it in a paper bag because it will rot within hours. Um, so never any plastic. You always need something that is porous because you are picking something that is part of this whole system, right? And you want those spores to be able to stay in this system and continue to do all the good things that they're doing. Questions? Easy. Are we only picking chanterelles? Uh, there's white chanterelles out here. There's golden chanterelles like these. 
And uh, at some point, somewhere in here, at least last year, there was a cauliflower, a big white guy. Uh, if you find the cauliflower, come get me. And uh, we only pick about half to two-thirds of a cauliflower. They're slightly rare. And uh, we always like to leave some. Um, but it'll look like a big white cauliflower brain. Um, and it'll be at the base of a tree. Um, so, everybody know who these people who are helping you not get lost are? Raise your hands. All right. If we see something that doesn't look like that, <laughs> we should not pick it. Great question. There's a lot of mushrooms out here. Don't pick them all. <laughs> They're doing their thing, whatever it is. We're still learning that. Uh, no, you can call me over. Some, there's some other, Candace is great. Uh, there's a bunch of other folks who know some mushroom stuff, so uh, just put the call out. Um, and if there's nobody around, just, you know, just leave it. Um, but yeah, there's a ton of other stuff. I do not know every mushroom that is out here. There's two million species, etc. cetera. Um, so I know a lot of them. Uh, but go ahead and call me and we'll see. Uh, but basically today we are picking the white chanterelle and the golden chanterelle. And when we get back to the cars, we'll have some lunch in about an hour, right? And then uh, before you all leave, I will look through every single person's basket to make sure that that's all you got, all you have is edibles. So. All right, let's do right. it. Thank you. Lost touch with reality. Open to find a mystic tree. Found some already? I, I don't know. Oh, what do you think? Uh, Looks like it. You know, that very well could be. That's why we have them look them over at That's the end. That's right. Here's, that one looks more like yeah, it. Yeah, that one definitely looks like it. <laughs> How can you tell it's a good one? Because <laughs> it looks delicious. See? <laughs> I'll show you. It's nice and fresh. The lines are nice and fresh. They're not all mucked up. Oh, Whereas yeah. this one's a little less fresh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can definitely see the difference. <laughs> one looks like it's been in a plastic bag for a week. <laughs> I think this one just got born. Yeah, oh. and you got one there. That's a good one. Yeah, not bad. All right. Let's see. Yeah, these are beauties. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. How are you going to cook them? Oh, oh gosh. I'm thinking soup maybe. Soup? Or Butter. Sa saute, <laughs> yeah. Get the full flavor. Maybe some herbs. Oh, yeah. Oops, my first time. Oh, yeah. All right. How about bright red? Isn't that pretty? It's nice. So how you guys, how are you going to cook them? I'm going for the sautéed and butter. So strange. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah, that's that purple one I mentioned a little while ago. Is that an edible? I don't think so. It'd be good to put it in there. Oh, here's another one. Pretty good, uh, pretty good example. They're a little wet from the rain, but not too bad. There's a few out there that are moldy, so I think we got here yeah. just in time. Yeah, when I come home, I usually just lay them out on like uh, paper bags and let the paper bags soak them up. Soak all the rainwater up and then uh, and dry fry them to get the rest of the water out. And, yeah. and then you cook butter. them. Then you cook some them. butter and some onions and some soy sauce. And oh, so dry fry them is the way you cook them then. Well, because they're usually pretty waterlogged. I mean, you have to have rain to grow a mushroom. So, you know, you also want to get that rainwater out of there. Right. Um, yeah. Plus, you don't get the rubbery texture. You want the water, you know, kind of makes it a little rubbery. So, yeah. Put them in the pan, dry, and then cook all this water out of them and then you throw in your fat and oil. No idea what that is. It's a dyer's polypore. Um, and it's, if you see this bright yellow yarn in this book, it's actually, you can use this mushroom to dye yarn. Huh. Oh, be darn. Yeah. So you knew that or you just figured that out? Um, 
I, I figured it out using this book, but I've seen mushrooms like this before, so I figured I could probably identify it. So apparently this isn't your first trip mushrooming. <laughs> no, it's not. I'm a mycology student, so I'm really, really excited to be out here and doing this. All right. This is cool. So what was that called again? It's called a Dyer's polypore, is its common name, and its, it's a Latin name is Phaleous schweinitzitzi. If you want, you can see right here, this is it. Oh yeah, there's one that's orange there. It must be a different different kind. Then. That's the fresher kind, and this oh. is what they look like when they get older. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah. And then the way that you can identify them is that they list the key identification factors right here. So the underside doesn't have gills, it has pores. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. And then if you bruise it, if you just like press on it, it turns a dark brown color. Mm. Mm -hmm. Does that mm. damage it? Um, I mean, if you are going to harvest it anyway, you're going to be mushing it up yeah. to make the dye. Is so it, it's, it's, a, it's not used for food then? No, it's not, it's not really edible, I don't think. It says not recommended. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But this is a really awesome find. I'm so excited to have I've seen these out here a, lot, a number of times. Have you? Yeah. Wow, well, cool. Have you hunted for these before? No, this is my first time. All so right. I'm definitely enjoying it. And you, how, how you plan on cooking these? Oh, well, definitely sauteed with olive oil and make bruschetta and maybe with phyllo dough. I didn't get any huge ones, but they're all pretty good. It was a nice patch. How are you going to cook those up? Oh, I'm hoping with a nice steak. <laughs> <laughs> You're the first one to say that. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. That's okay. <laughs> I'm not a vegetarian. <laughs> you guys are doing well then. You happy with what you're finding? Definitely. All right. Um, I love picking and being in a new section of woods is always a nice experience. So you're, you're not new at this then? No, no, but I'm always learning. How'd you guys do? Did you get a lot of mushrooms? We got a fair amount, but I don't really like mushrooms, so it's okay, I guess. <laughs> We're making Dutch pancakes with them. What? Are Dutch pancakes? Yeah. They're like crepes. Yeah, my roommate's from the Netherlands, so. Oh. I so made her promise to make me Dutch pancakes tonight with the mushrooms. Has she ever eaten these particular kind of mushrooms before? I don't think so, so we'll see. All right, Wait. interesting. What are you going to do with all those, Matthew? Well, you know, I'm going to uh, dry fry them, you know, in a skillet without oil and get all the liquid out of it, you know, put it in a cup and save it and uh, fry them up and you know, mix some more soups, add the liquid back in. Um, so you put the liquid into, into soups later on, other soups then? Yep. Is it, it, do the, does the liquid retain a lot of the nutrients and the proteins? Um, it has a lot of flavor and, you know, probably some stuff, but uh, um, yeah, it's a, it's a way to, to get them fried up and crispy because they have a lot of water in it. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, they, they do hide here and, yeah, it's, uh, it's a nice mushroom. They don't get any uh, insects and, I mean, basically nothing gets them all eaten up. So once once they clear cut them, they destroyed all of that stuff below ground. Because they only replant, they'll take you know weeks or months or years to replant. Well those roots still have that fungal attachment and they'll survive for a couple of months. But they're not getting any more carbon, right? Because the tree is dead. And so clear cutting is the worst possible thing you can do to a forest. And we're not talking just about forest, we're talking about what grows it, right? I mean, the forest grows itself, but we're talking about the soil. So it's all one, so they, you know, we can't do any more clear cutting, which thankfully we've gotten them to stop mostly, at least in this area. Um, and, you know, in a clear cut, that sun comes beating down and all the other stuff generally dies as well. So the fungus can survive on these roots of shrubs and whatnot, but 
you have to replant really quickly, and it's just this huge devastating impact to begin with. Anyway, we cut down all of this food source for the below ground communities. And I'm only talking fungi. Let's talk bacteria and rotifers and protozoa. I mean, all I know about is a little bit of fungi stuff. There is so much more going on down there. And we, uh, we just went hiking in Unit 114 and picked all these uh, chanterelle mushrooms. And the cards are... What was that road? The road is the 6330. The unit is 114. The unit is what the Forest Service calls a place they want to cut. <laughs> we call them groves or forests or whatever, and they call them units. Where's the actual unit boundary? I didn't see it. Uh, they haven't marked any of these boundaries out here, which is why it's really hard, they make it extra hard. to know um, where we are. So who do we address it to, basically? Uh, for a supervisor. Just for, and then, are we talking about the entire timber sale or set tins of Well, it? since you came out and experienced part of it, I, would, you know, I wouldn't lie, I wouldn't say whatever, but um, say you know, whatever your general idea is on, on logging or mm -hmm. think, you know, the public on, lands. Yeah. Right based on some of the reasons I gave you. But what is this section called? You said it. I, I, this is Unit 114. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Why do they look at it? It's like, oh, there's a short-term gain to get some money. Well, there is a couple of laws out there that require multiple use and management of our national public lands. Okay. And they get to use that to go ahead and, you know, this used to be all, you've seen the stumps, used to be all this huge old growth. So because of that rule, they are, quote, required to do something for the public benefit. So they do have some wildernesses, they do have some trails as well, but they also are required to basically make some money. Um, we don't think in the end that we should have logging on any national forest ever again. It's my viewpoint and some other people's viewpoints because we've logged 97% of all of it in this country. So there's only 3% that hasn't been touched left. We can recycle a little bit more, we can you know, do some hemp, we can do all these other things to get that, that 3% that comes off of or the, uh, sorry, they've logged 97% but there's only 3% of the old growth left. The amount of timber that comes off of the national forest provides 3% of the U.S.'s supply. That's it. So, I mean, you see these massive clear cuts, right? And it only provides 3%, so a little bit more recycling in places. You know, we live in Portland, so we're great recyclers, but imagine other areas where they don't have even newspaper recycling. Um, just a little bit more recycling, maybe planting some other species to grow for paper, etc. We don't need to cut. So what's an alternative to gain, like an alternative to gain that monetary resource that the Forest Service needs? Yep. Well, <clears throat> it's, it's our public lands, and as public citizens, we get to decide what we want our public lands to be managed for. And so if we all say zero cut, no more logging whatsoever, and these are some really good reasons why we don't even need this stuff anymore, you've already killed off the grizzly bear, you've killed off the wolf, I mean, all of these things. It's not just the federal government that did that. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, again, doing some more recycling, etc. Tourism. We could do tons of tourism out here. We could do mycological tourism. All the species that come back, the salmon, the hiking, and the yeah. others. So there is tons of other ways to actually get, uh, you know, income, if that's what we wanted to do, from these public lands. Well, the Forest Service seems to be involved in managing those public lands. Like, they're, they're ours, but the Forest Service is in charge of stewarding that resource. Right, and that's why these things are important, because yeah. you actually are saying, hey, look, I just went out and checked this out, and I either love what you're doing, or I really don't like it, and, and you should do this and, and not do that. So that's, that's how you know, these comments are extremely important and useful. Thank you.